Hello, everybody. It's October the 8th. It's a Friday, and that is the time for That Was the Week. I'm thrilled that our show is beginning to take off. We're now um, being distributed by Lit Hub on their Facebook page, and we're also going to be featured on my Keen On podcast on a weekly basis. So it's all very exciting, Keith, and all because of Keith, because you're such a, a mega star, <laughs> Keith. Well, Andrew, I'm glad that as my agent, you are promoting me. That's all I can say. Yeah, if I was your agent, I would be very poor. Um, earlier this week, Keith, I said, we've got to have a show dedicated to Facebook this week. And actually, as it happens, as we're speaking, some of the good news today always seems to be bad news on a Friday. The good news today is Friday, October the 8th, is that my old friend, uh, very brave woman, Maria Ressa, who's one of the great critics of Facebook and social media, the Filipino activist journalist, uh, just won the Nobel Peace Prize. So that's really great news. I'm thrilled for her uh, and for her team at Rappler. I've been out to Manila a couple of times to speak with her at her conferences, and she's a remarkably brave and smart woman. Um, Keith, uh, I said to you, let's have a whole show on Facebook. And of course, You've written an editorial this week in defense of Facebook. Uh, is that fair? You're, as always, the contrarian, the Peter Thiel amongst us. And you're saying that we should be somewhat skeptical of the Facebook whistleblower this week. Yeah, I wouldn't really say I wrote a pro-Facebook editorial, but I wrote a, um, um an editorial that tried to understand the narrative that's being evolved through the whistleblowers um, interviews and question that narrative framework. Um, if, if we had a conversation about my critique of Facebook, I'd have plenty of negative things to say about them. But, but the one thing I think I wouldn't say is that uh, Facebook is doing something wrong by seeking to have us engage more with Facebook. It seems to me that Facebook's growth and profit focus is inevitable in the world we live in and no different than the focus, let's say, of a FedEx or, or any company basically that's, who's, who has shareholders and whose job is to produce a profit. So the idea that Facebook should put people first is kind of a bizarre idea. Let, let's use... Let's use the analogy of the tobacco business, which the whistleblower brought up. And could you, we could also use fast food or the alcohol business. Um, and, and the tobacco business is a really good example. Oh, everybody knows now that tobacco kills. I think even the tobacco industry acknowledges that. Yep. It's becoming increasingly clear, and this is one of the issues that the whistleblower brought up and that's been in the news over the last couple of weeks, is that social media isn't particularly good for us, or it's certainly bad for teenagers, uh, female teenagers. At what point, like the tobacco industry, in which Philip Morris has radically diversified, uh, at what point will Facebook have to or should diversify its business so that an acknowledged, a, a product that acknowledged that, that most people would agree doesn't do a lot of good um, is yeah. managed more responsibly by them. So, so I, I actually don't agree with the use of that analogy. Um, tobacco was the cause of death. It was the direct cause. And so you could fix the problem by stopping people using tobacco. Uh, and so it made total sense. Um, Facebook is not the cause of harm to girls. Harm to girls is rooted in... And we're talking about Instagram more than Facebook, actually, in terms Instagram of Instagram and Facebook. The accusations um, on they, the they are, damage are not, to, to yeah. teenage girls' psyches. Yeah. Uh, well, let's just start in, with the positive. There's no doubt that some teenage girls on Instagram will be harmed. That's correct. But Instagram is not tobacco. It isn't causing the harm. The cause of the harm is that girls in society are treated like second-class citizens who are, have a, you know, as a prospect, a worse job with worse pay, probably being a mother at home for some of their life and not having a job at all. We see in the, in the reconciliation bill 
that is being fought about in Congress today, a proposal to give preschool um, education as a universal right, which would have a massive positive impact on girls. Instagram isn't the cause. The cause so is, what would be the equivalent the industry? Okay, I, I, I take your point on that in a way, perhaps. Would the equivalent industry be alcohol? Uh, well, alcohol it, it itself is the cause of a problem. Facebook, yeah, but, but as, a, as the alcohol industry would no. argue, a, a glass of wine every evening is not going to result in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in car crashes or domestic violence, although medical researchers are increasingly finding that even a glass of wine a night is, might be a, a cause of cancer. I mean, there's got to be an equivalent industry yeah. here, Keith. It's no, not as if social um, media is that well, new. Well, if you want an equivalent, then the right place to start is defining what Instagram and Facebook are. Okay, we'll go on. And trying to find uh, an equivalent. Uh, uh, they, they don't produce a harmful product. What they produce is a technology platform that lets you post pictures, videos, words um, in various combinations. It itself doesn't post any of them. Um, uh, so, uh, so basically, it's the nearest equivalent would be a bar or a school playground. Okay, and school playgrounds are carefully policed and regulated. And uh, so you don't stop so why shouldn't Facebook be carefully uh, regulated? Um, you know, they're, they're, they're policed and regulated, but they don't stop people coming in. Like the but they do. The you're not allowed yeah. to go into a bar if you're under 18. Andrew, I have, I have a slightly and, and grown-ups actually. Well, in, in, so hold on, in, in in San Francisco, where where I am, um, if if a, if a thirty-year-old man walks into a child's playground uh, without a child, they're liable to be arrested. Look, the, the the way to think of it is this: in order to be thrown out of a bar, you have to do some egregious harm, and that's true on Facebook. In order yeah, but not to, everyone can uh, go wait, into wait, a Wait, 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 let me finish. In a school playground, which we've all been in as kids, and we all remember the bullying that went on, that the teachers had no clue about, that, that, that the harm to girls starts there. Now, if you, if you think that Facebook can be better with 2.9 billion people, can be better than society is at dealing with girls, I think that's a mistake. I don't think it can be better. I think it's going to be no worse, um, uh, but that's bad because why? The world is bad. We have, a, we have sexism. It's structural. Girls are not treated differently to boys. So let's, let's um, instead of being kind of, you know, these kind of middle-class observers who can uh, diagnose problems. If you really want to fix them, Facebook isn't the place to fix it. Facebook's just a symptom. Yeah, but it's such a massive, powerful symptom that by making that argument, you're essentially allowing Facebook not to be accountable for the consequences of its power. I agree that Facebook can't solve these structural issues in society, um, but on the other hand, it's become so powerful, so ubiquitous, so influential on our democracy, on our psyches, that this stuff has to be addressed. I also agree with you on your critique of the whistleblower. I think, you know, she's riding the zeitgeist now uh, in a way that's probably not very productive for anyone except her. But um, she's been very clever, by the way. She's, um, she's used the SEC complaints procedure. Um, uh, which is what you do. We're going to get a book out of her and a movie and all the well, rest of it. But, but more significant it, than that, Andrew, she's um, she's claiming that Facebook has lied to its investors, which, by the way, if that were to be proven, would be billions of dollars of fine, of which she would get a share as the whistleblower. Yeah, I don't think she's going to get any money out of that. But, uh, I mean, the zeitgeist has dramatically shifted, hasn't it, Keith? Uh, and and yeah. Facebook has become the convenient punch bag for everybody who doesn't like tech. That's my biggest concern with what's happening. Yeah. Well, is that I, I Facebook just wish the is, people... is vilified continually, and Zuckerberg particularly because, 
he's so bad at public relations or so indifferent to it. Meanwhile, Amazon and Google and, and all the other big players seem to be under the radar. No one's acknowledging or looking at what they're doing. Uh, I think it's even worse than that. It's um, tech is taking the, the hit for society. Uh, capitalism uh, is the world we live in. Profit is its measure. Um, and, you know, if people really want to question profit as a motive, they have to question the structure of society we live in because until that changes, Facebook's doing the right thing. The other thing is society is where racism lives. It's where sexism lives. It's where uh, homophobia lives. And, you know... Uh, insofar as it's in society, it's going to be in all of these places. It's so easy, and, and but you're talking to someone here who spent 20 years as a political activist. I, I literally didn't work for, I did my first startup when I was 40 and I was a You still don't activist. work, Keith, you do this. I, exactly. And, and you know, I actually did take on, I wrote a book about racism, I organized marches and protests, I helped people who are subject to immigration, hiding them from the police, I actually did things. It seems that if you want to be a critique of harm to girls and be serious about it, you wouldn't be talking about Facebook. You'd be talking what about... What about the defense if, if, if we were talking, say, about alcohol and someone defending the, um, the wine industry or the, the whiskey industry? They say, well, our problem is that our, our product isn't bad. The problem is that there are addictive there's an addictive chemistry in the human body. So the problem is the human body. It's not our problem. There's always ways of, of avoiding responsibility yeah. and accountability. Yeah. Funnily enough, one of my neighbors, uh, Anna Lemke, is on the New York Times bestseller list talking about addictive personalities um, and all over social media right now talking about that. Um, you know, I, I definitely don't believe uh, alcohol or tobacco for that matter, um, uh, you know, I, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life, ever. It was in my home, my mom and dad and siblings all smoked. Um, so, you know... Um, you like a nice glass of wine though, Keith. Uh, who doesn't? Or two or three or four. If I sit down in front of Netflix, um, if I open a bottle, uh, the bottle is going to be empty by the end of the movie. Um, but well, here's my uh, yeah, yeah. But I think it is important yeah. not to confuse humanity with um, the things that exist, as if humanity has no choice. That when something exists, you have no choice. Yeah, I, I, look, I buy all that, but you are still abstracting out. The fact is that Facebook, for better or worse, is is enormously powerful in terms of shaping our democracy, our, our sense of who we are, um, I disagree. fake news and all the rest I of it. I even disagree with that. I even disagree with that. Well, what I, about the fact, I mean, it's been proven that that Facebook has had a big impact on the crisis of, of, of information and truth and the spread of lies. I don't it's agree. Been, that has, you don't even believe that? You don't that think the Russians used yeah. Facebook to spread lies? It's, it's in the same class of argument as the argument that says Alfred Hitchcock movies made people murderers. It's, it's completely rubbish. The media, Facebook included, doesn't create humanity. Humanity creates media. It's, that's the right way around. Humanity creates media. And those problems and are not created by Facebook, but they exist in Facebook for sure. And I don't know about you, I actually believe Zuckerberg when he says they're doing the best they can to, um, to um, deal with things that fall outside their rules. I just think it's hard. It's, it's not easy. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are not yet good enough to be successful at that. Yeah, I mean, I agree with in, in a sense, but I think it's absurd for you to be suggesting that Facebook is not damaging democracy. It's it's self-evident. Everybody agrees on that. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> Everybody uh, on regulation. Um, is this whistleblower, is, is it going to result in, this, in more regulation, less regulation? Are they going to split Facebook up? Will it make any difference if Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp were split into separate companies? Some people believe it wouldn't make any difference anyway. Um, well, firstly, I don't think it's going to happen. 
I, I, I don't think the law or, or the um, desire or, or the methodology that would be required to make it happen will happen. Um, the regulatory aspect here is the SEC, which is basically a way to make money, not a way to regulate, because their only instrument is a fine. So, uh, so that definitely isn't going to go there. There's a, a quite strong narrative um, about you know uh, the cracks beginning to show, and I, de I definitely think that's correct. I mean, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is probably living through some of the most difficult moments of his life and is trying to find a narrative. Well, he looks like it. He needs to get a proper haircut, I think. Yeah. So he's trying to find a narrative that, that basically helps the world understand the problem from his point of view. And the world doesn't want to listen. To yeah, no one. Look, whatever. Even you're not sympathetic to Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, you can't be sympathetic to him. I mean, I, I would say anyone that still... comes with problems and accountability. No one would deny that. Even he wouldn't deny that. I, I would say uh, anyone that's built software that has attracted lots of people has some empathy for him because when you build software, the things that people do with it uh, surprise you. Um, I, I built an app called Just Me, and it took me a while to realize it, but single men, mainly from Asia, India in particular, were aggressively hitting on women on my app. Uh, in, in an obnoxious way. And it took me a while to realize it. And when I realized it, the question of what can I do about it came up. And in order to do anything about it, I would basically would have had to close my app down. So what I ended up doing was giving building in complaint as a feature. And now women could complain. And if there were, if there were more than three complaints against someone, they were automatically deleted from the system. So, so I did figure out a way in the end, but it's not easy to do these things, especially at scale. Yeah, and I mean the the comparison between just me and Facebook is again. Uh, uh, this is from um, this is really good, by the way. It's, uh, uh, the fifth estate is what um, Zuckerberg described Facebook as. He made the point that, to your point about how powerful it is, he made the point that Facebook is something new that the world has never had before which is a supranational platform that reflects everything that exists in the world. It isn't even the media where you've got editorial control. It's something new. And, the, and, and he, they make the point the world... It was needs... something new. I don't think it's particularly new anymore. And I think, as always, we're fighting yesterday's wars. Um, I think Facebook's actually rather old and boring. And... Uh, you you have um, a link to a review of a book by um, uh, Azim Aziz uh, on uh, exponential technology in which he talks about a new wave of technology radically changing everything much more dramatically than Facebook. And I think he's right. Yeah, this is Azim Azar. Um, Azim Azar. Not Azim. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I put two things in the editorial as a contrast with the Facebook narrative. The first was this book, which is about the inevitability of accelerating growth. And accelerating growth can be a bit of a woolly term that disguises uh, what it really means. But, you know, one of the things it means is massive scale human infrastructure that brings people together across borders in billions um that that facebook yeah. facebook is not the end game there something even bigger than that is coming and faster and less controllable so that that is azim's point and he makes the point that society isn't really ready to deal with how fast those changes are, are and will continue to happen. Yeah, Parag Khanna has a new book out. It's coming on my show next week on migration. So there's a and lot of huge other... things. And, and, and what we're missing, Keith, at least according to the newsletter this week, is Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs would fix it all, would he? Well, so this is the Steve Jobs, uh, the Steve Jobs uh, video that Apple made to celebrate uh, his life 10 years from his passing. And... Um, if you contrast this narrative to the narrative around Facebook, it, it, it is quite compelling. Tell me if you can hear the sound, by the way. 
I can't hear the sound. Um, so maybe other people can't either. I'll, I'll, I'll actually put this, let's stop it now and I'll, I'll slot the video in for the, for the edited version. But it's basically Steve Jobs talking about change and the obsessive focus on change and that the proof of success is that people adopt what you offer them. Um, all of which I think is similar to what Facebook does. And, um, and, and Facebook is way more successful at Apple measured by the numbers of people that adopt it. Uh, yet Jobs is a sympathetic character and Zuckerberg isn't. And, that, and that's because Zuckerberg's paying the price for us. Like Jobs never paid the price for us. If, if a bad person used a Mac, you'd never know. Um, but if a bad person uses Facebook, it's there for all to see. So in a way, whereas Jobs didn't pay a price for us, the human beings, Zuckerberg does. He gets, he gets punished for, for, for allowing us to exist. I mean, um, he gets punished for allowing us to be as we are, which is yeah. dishonest and nasty. Yeah. Well, uh, many people are dishonest and nasty. I hope I'm not one of them, and I know for sure you're not, but there are many. But around. I'm not on Facebook. Are you on Facebook? I am on Facebook. Mainly I'm not on for Facebook or reasons. Instagram or WhatsApp. I'm a conscientious objector to all three. Yeah, no, I am. But anyway, the Jobs movie is great. I'll, I'll, uh, the, the actual full video is in the newsletter, so people can watch it there. Well, what else is happening this week? We've got Facebook. Steve Jobs can't come back to save us. What about uh, innovation for employees and creators? You're saying that Silicon Valley is once again revolutionizing work? Well, uh, you know, work, work is uh, interesting. Um, I, I was at dinner last night, and one of the people at the dinner was somebody who works at a big Silicon Valley um, creative company, let's say, and talked about the fact that they have a thousand seats. the name of the company, at least, Keith. Adobe. They have a thousand seats in the office, and only about 50 of them are full every day right now. Uh, and so th things are changing, but the focus of this story is actually changing how you reward employees with stock. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a massive labor shortage right now in the U.S., including casual labor. So you've got things like Jack in the Box paying $1,000 sign-on bonuses to $20 an hour employees. Um, but that labor shortage is kind of everywhere. Um, and in response to it, Silicon Valley companies are changing the way that they issue stock to issue much larger amounts of stock in much shorter frames of time. The, the, the typical way of doing it was, you know, it would work for a company that would say, here's some stock every month for four years. Some of it becomes yours. And at the end of four years, it's all yours. Now what they're doing is annualizing these grants and they're making them bigger to attract people and to keep people. And at the end of one year, you get another grant for the next year, so you're not inclined to leave. Well, it's golden um, handcuffs. I mean, it's, they're not doing it because they're generous. They're doing it because they need to keep people. They, they need to keep people. And the, the, the other uh, part is this, which is it was, um, this is about the creator economy. Um, and this is all about the nature of work. It, apparently, YouTube supports the equivalent of nearly 400,000 employees through creator payments which is uh, amazing. It's contributed $20.5 billion to U.S. gross domestic product last year, which is a, a not inconsiderable number. Um, so, um, you know, both the nature of work is changing and um, given that you don't have to work for a company anymore if you're a creator, the companies have to make it attractive for you to want to work for them. Uh, so that's the, the, two, the two things that uh, got my attention this week. And Africa is rising again. It rises every week, Keith, and yet we never see it. What's happening with Africa this week? Uh, you know, I've got a little sub-theme that I pay attention to to do with Africa just because I find it, um, well, firstly, Africa is going to become a, a massive middle-class economy over the next 20, 25, 30 years. And most people don't realize that. Um, and the beginnings of venture capital uh, are being deployed there. So this is Google putting $50 million into a fund focused on Africa. Uh, this is something called the Impact Africa Network launching with $25 million. And it's just more evidence that 
external money is beginning to understand that Africa is important and interesting at the same time. I mean, Africa's demographic explosion is interesting. I'm not convinced it's going to be near the next middle class. I mean, we've heard that for the last 25 years, but we'll see over the next 25 years, Keith. What about startup of the week? As long as it's not Facebook. Startup of the week is vertical farms in general. This is from, uh, this is from the and economy. And you have uh, some interest here shall we say yeah i'm a, i'm a, a i own shares in a company called infarm which is one of the one of the there's about 10 big companies in this space and it's one of them um they're in they're in europe most of the others are here in the us and this is a story from the economist about how agriculture is changing in response to urbanization and how you know both the way we grow food and the cost of food and the quality of food are all going to improve in good direction because of that. So I thought it was uh, worth highlighting. Although coming back to the Facebook theme, or your argument at least about Facebook, we're not eating, in America at least, we're not eating any better. I mean, people are eating worse and worse. Obesity is more and more of a central problem. So uh, so, so these green castles in the sky, to borrow the headline, they're the kind of reverse of Facebook. Do we need regulation to insist that people eat their veggies? Keith? Well, there's a lot of regulation around food, actually more than anything, because of the possibility of poisoning people and such. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of regulations around food already. Um, it's, it's um, you know, it seems to me that technology, technology changes everything. And the word change doesn't imply a value judgment, does it? It's not good or bad, it's just change. Well, food is also the tweet of the week, and food, labor, it all comes together, Keith. We've, we've, we've done our homework this week in terms of building a coherent story. And the only thing that the tweet of the week doesn't have is Facebook. So what's the tweet of the week? The tweet of the week is to do with um, a restaurant uh, called Cala. Uh, and Ian Hogarth says, it wasn't until the lockdown ended and Cala customers could visit the restaurant in person that the reason became clear, instead of a team of chefs... The food is cooked and assembled by a robot. And it links through to uh, an article on Sifted, which is a great publication in Europe, that shows how, how that works. And I included it because, um, you know, we talk a lot about the change of the meaning of the word work driven by automation. We've talked quite a bit about universal basic income, which was in the news this week with um, Andrew Yang forming his own political party. And it felt to me that restaurants using robots to prepare and deliver food, um, while not maybe the key driver of these trends, is just another example that it's real. Yeah, and the tweet says it, it means that the company can make significant savings on real estate costs. Uh, but of course, the real issue here is the future of labor and jobs. Uh, whether people want to work in restaurants, it's not the best kind of work. It's not the best paid kind of work, but a lot of people need that kind of work. So that's a subject for another show, Keith. That was the week of October the 8th, 2021. Keep well, keep using Facebook, keep being the one person who's willing to defend Mark Zuckerberg. You may get a call from him, he'll offer you a job, and he may even give you some equity too, Keith. Maybe what we do next week is we'll talk, uh, do another show, which is more Azim Azar's point in Exponential, which the restaurant example is a good example well, of. Maybe we can get Azim uh, uh, on our show. He's a nice we should guy. Probably he's get him on, on my the other show. show. He's, a good, he's very coherent, and he'll add a third wheel to our game, Keith. And talk about the social consequences of technology, because technology is inevitable, but the social consequences are where we get to define how we react to it. Well, maybe, note. maybe Keith, maybe not. We'll talk about it next week. That was the week for October the 8th. Keep well, keep thinking, keep aggravating people, and we'll be back next week. Arrivederci.